Okay, so I will start with a short summary of what I said um, until now about coarsening. Uh, so I also have uh, you know things to write on the blackboard today. So if you want to to get clarifications, I, I can write them down uh, in my whiteboard. So I'm talking about a problem for which we know the phases and the phase transitions. This is important because okay we have a lot of information about the problem beforehand. We know the other parameter in equilibrium. Uh, we evaluated the evolution of the problem with uh, Monte Carlo simulations or with the Langevin equations for the uh, coarse grain field. And we observed that uh, what I called in the first lecture a one-time quantity, so this space-time correlation function, uh, does not reach a constant uh, over the times which we can explore with the simulations or, or the calculation. So. Um, then the system is out of equilibrium because in the first lecture I told you that to have one necessary condition to be in equilibrium is that one time observables reach constant and this one doesn't reach a constant. So with this we know also by making some arguments about the way in which this length grows in time that the equilibration time diverges with the system size because we see that for the correlation length or the growing length better said, to reach the system size, we need a time that should scale with the system size. And hence, if the system size goes to infinity first in my calculation or in the real life, then the time needed to reach equilibrium diverges as well. So um, we can also identify the mechanisms for growth uh, of critical structures if we quench to the critical point or of uh, you know other structures if we quench below the critical point. So uh, taking advantage of those mechanisms, we can evaluate or we can give estimates uh, for this growing length. Uh, and in both cases, quenches to the critical point and quenches below the critical point, we observed dynamic scaling. And this dynamic scaling, I wrote it in, in this way, uh, with difficult, different, sorry, different um, ways to deal with the contribution at short length scales uh, for which the system behaves as in equilibrium and then long length scales uh, we realized that it was not in equilibrium and uh, this equilibration uh, contribution let's say uh, appears in different ways for quenches in the critical point and quenches in the subcritical point um, in one case is multiplicative we call it this way and in the other case is additive so this is more or less everything i said yesterday now, uh, hi, ma'am. Yes. Uh, like, if you go back one more slide, uh, yeah. Uh, like, can you explain the third point again? I mean, uh, at the critical point, one one-time quantities won't reach equilibrium. Is that the statement you're making? Both at the critical point or below the critical point. So um, the uh, this space-time correlation function is a special case of a one-time quantity because I'm measuring correlations, you know, at different points in space, but at the same time. So I'm measuring instantaneously on the sample. And uh, I see that these correlation functions are still very far away from the equilibrium form uh, that I expect, both below and at the critical point. But for a long time, we expect them to go there, right? After yes, but then when you realize that these long times should scale with the system size, okay. it's everything an issue of the order of limits. You know, if you work at finite size and you take times that grow with system size in an adequate way, then you can go beyond the equilibration time and yeah. reach equilibrium. Instead, if you take first the system size to infinity and then times uh, you made them grow, uh, but always being you know, smaller than a function of the system size, then you will not reach equilibrium. So it's an issue of uh, orders of limits. Thanks. You're welcome. Are there other questions about this? Yeah, uh, I had one question. Like, yes. uh, in this subsequent uh, slide. Yes. Uh, the, the critical and subcritical are uh, described by the same scaling function. Is it obvious? Oh, no, no. It's, uh, no, it's just a mistake in my notes. Uh, it, it, they are different. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, this F are... and F are, are different. Yes, sorry. It's okay, just that okay. I didn't distinguish them. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. And, and is, uh, is, it, is this your claim? Uh, like if, if uh, the 
order parameter is not conserved for mm-hmm. for a system then then uh, uh, in in those systems also like uh, the the this scaling functions are same um no 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 the scaling functions depend uh, they they will be uh, in principle they are different so if you look at a problem with other parameter which is non conserved and then a problem which is uh, you use another parameter which is conserved the scaling functions will differ in general one from the other one. yeah but i'm asking so this is for just a generic mm-hmm. yeah sorry but no, but please. i'm asking for systems say with, with in which like two systems in which the order parameter is not conserved then are they are like the, the these functions are identical or i mean are ah. there any universality classes that's the question uh, uh, this is a this is a hard question so for example uh take a ferromagnetic system with uh, interactions which are all equal so an easing model and then take a case in which you have weak disorder so you have fluctuations in the coupling strengths but they are all of the same sign so there is no frustration i will talk about frustration later on but uh you know you take another ferromagnetic system but with different coupling strengths uh that you can take distribute it in some way but you know always ferromagnetic and then uh there are claims that the scaling function doesn't depend on which kind of interactions you are taking so that the scaling function is also universal and that there is this super universality uh, is not proven and from numerical simulations uh, is not that clear so there are people who claim that there is i i have claimed that there was in in certain numerical simulations but then uh, some other people say that in other cases uh, this is not really holds so th- this is an open issue uh, uh, all right thank you yeah okay. Okay, so now let me tell you a little bit about two time correlations. So now this will be local in space, but non local in time. And uh, it's just another way of proving these problems. Uh, But it's useful because in other cases, which are more complex than just coarsening phenomena, uh, these are the kind of correlations that people measure and um, experimentalists in particular, and uh, also, you know, in mean field models where you don't have a notion of distances, uh, problems which, you know, connect your spins uh, all together, all to all. Uh, so there is a, you know, fully connected graph, if you wish. Uh, then in those cases, it's two time correlations, the ones that you will define and the ones that will tell you about the evolution of the problem, since you don't have a notion of space. So. Two time correlations are the correlations of, say, a spin with itself, but measured at different times. And you can average over the thermal histories as usual. So this is the angular brackets here. And you can sum over all the, all the spins, for example, in a simulation to, to have a better behaved um, data. But still, I mean, it's not really necessary if you do the average over the noise to, to do this system over over the system averages <coughs> summing over the, all the spins so this is a, a quantity that depends on two times so from what i said in the first lecture many time in particular case two time objects in equilibrium should be stationary then they should depend on time differences only however out of equilibrium of course this is not necessarily satisfied and what happens in this coarsening problems is that these two time correlations depend not only on the time difference, but also on the waiting time. This is the way in which it's called this first time at which, you know, you take a picture of the sample and you measure this as IFTW, you let it evolve, and then you correlate with all the subsequent times, uh, which I call in T in this uh, slide. So uh, different curves here correspond to different waiting times at which I start measuring. And uh, as you see, they are ordered in such a way that the shorter waiting time has as fastest decay, the longer uh, the waiting time, the slower the decay of these correlations. So this is an effect which is called aging. So the older the sample, the slower it decays. This is um, the reasoning for, for this name. And it's a phenomenon that you will see appears in many, many different kinds of systems, uh, even in problems of glassy character, which are not necessarily um, due to a coarsening process. 
so why do I write a stationary relaxation and age in decay here? Well, because if you look at what happens at short time differences, so the time differences are what's written in the horizontal axis here. Uh, so you will see that the curves start falling one on top of each other. So there is here a short time regime in which the decay is indeed stationary because there is no waiting time dependence because all the curves over superpose. But then if you go to longer time dependence, uh, sorry, longer time and distances, uh, you see that the curves uh, deviate and they are not all uh, on top of each other. They are all different indeed. So what happens is that at short time distances, the decay is stationary. And this is what I'm representing here with this contribution C stationary of T minus TW. While at longer time distances, uh, the stationarity is broken. And then there is another contribution to the decay, which is uh, of a scaling kind. So you can also write it as a function, which is different from the other ones, of the ratio between the two growing lengths measured at the different times t and tw. So this is the part which satisfies dynamic scaling. This is a contribution that is telling you uh, what happens at short time distances. And then you have you know, all these matching conditions to make this correlation be normalized to one at equal times and decay to zero at a very longer distances in time, because this is what you see uh, occurring in these correlation uh, curves. So for this two time correlation function, this is the kind of um, uh, decay that you observe when you quench below the critical point. If you quench at the critical point, you will have something similar, but with multiplicative scaling between the stationary contribution and the non-stationary one. Now, what's the interpretation or what's uh, going on here. So let me draw on the blackboard a picture that will let you see what's going on. So I'm going to draw um, a sketch of a configuration at the waiting time, which is not realistic because I'm going to draw domains which are going to be squared because, okay, it's easier to, to draw, but this is not the kind of uh, geometry of the domains. It's just to give you an idea of what's going on. So imagine that at a given time, You have a structure of domains, which is of this form, uh, where you have you know, blocks of uh, spins, which are the domains. This is a domain. Where uh, the spins are ordered. Now, because of thermal fluctuations within this domain, there will be some reversed spins, also within all the other ones hmm, in, the, in the sketch. Now, at short time distances, you will not see the domain walls, which are these objects here. You will not uh, see the domain's walls moving. At short time distances, uh, the dynamics of the domain walls is don't have time enough to move. So the only thing you will see is the thermal fluctuations within the domains. So the decorrelation at short time distances has to do with just the normal equilibrium-like decorrelation that you have because of thermal fluctuations within the domain. And this is stationary because it's like in equilibrium. The system is like a patch of, uh, you know, patchwork of um, domains uh, of uh, constant size for the moment. And you have only these thermal fluctuations within them. But then if you look at longer time distances, the domain walls will have time to move. And uh, they will, the system will uh, grow its domains. And for example, I don't know, you will have something like this and uh, like that and like that. So these new red lines will be the new domain walls at a much larger, longer time, T. So then you see that you have, if you have ordered this part up, this part down, this part up and this part, down. Uh, then, okay, you have decorrelation, uh, which is due to the fact that here you have you had the spin down, and now you have a spin up. So you have have a much much more important decorrelation going on because all this part has reversed, and uh, all this part has reversed as well, and and so on and so forth. So the 
stationary decay that you have at short time distances uh, is due to thermal fluctuations within domains. And the aging decay that you have for longer time distances is related to the motion of the domain walls and the fact that you have this structural relaxation of the system, which is much more important um, than the uh, just, you know, some spins that turn around uh, within the domains. Okay, so this is the interpretation of uh, what's going on uh, here. And it's actually, you can see it if you, you know, look at the actual configurations. Of course, the actual configurations are not as simple as, uh, as I show you here on the blackboard, but you see that the mechanism is the same. Uh, excuse me. Ma yes. Uh, in here, it seems like uh, if you wait for longer time, the uh, correlations are speeding up in a sense that the like long time value are like going to okay, uh, like the these domain walls are uh, like increasing in size very fast compared to at shorter times. Uh, no, no, no. It's uh, it's. I'm using logarithmic scale here. So uh, okay, this is why this is, seems to be this way. I'm using logarithmic scale on the on both uh, axes, by the way. So um, if you if you look at how the domain walls uh, are killed, which is what's giving you an idea of how they move, uh, they are killed. We you know with a power law, um, the density of the domain walls go to zero, like uh, one over r, actually, uh, to some power, and then it's uh, you know it's everything is controlled by this power r of t. So um, yeah, this is okay. what's going on. And one other question here: if you say uh, like. Uh, um, stationary aging. I mean the the sub. Okay, C of t comma t w is C uh, uh, steady state t minus t w. But uh, mm -hmm. here if you see if we see the plots uh, mm -hmm. for t uh, w greater, it it's actually not zero. I mean it's not uh, uh, C of t comma t w is one. Two time correlator is one. But uh, larger, at, at, at equal times. Yeah, at uh, t equals to t w. Yeah. Yes. So um, if you exactly so if you see the way in which I defined the zero value of this C stationary, I define it to be one minus MX, and yeah. then I define the F of zero to be um, oh, the F of one, sorry, not the F of zero, when T is equal to TW to be one. So then you have one minus MX plus MX coming from the second uh, contribution, and then you have that. It should be one, right? It will be one. It will be one. It's a, it's a, it's a practical way of, uh, you know, having uh, two contributions which are positive to divide, to put the m squared uh, in the first, uh, minus m squared, sorry, in the limit of the first uh, contribution and uh, the m squared in the second one. But in the plot, it, it seems not the case, right? The the one, it's because it's a logarithmic scale. So the zero is, you know, it's towards the left of this plot, very far away. Oh, okay, okay, sorry. Yeah, so this is because, yeah, so the first point here is one. The yeah. first time the difference here is one. So zero is your far, far away. Yeah. Oh, cool, thanks. Yeah. Okay, so the sketch of how the two time correlations quenches to the critical point on the left and quenches below the critical point. To the These are just build them, you know, with the a numerical um, with a, some, some new plot <laughs> uh, because I, I put it by hand and then you can see very clearly that you know this stationary part in the critical quenches uh, appears uh, inclined and it goes to zero because the uh, other parameter goes to zero is zero in, at the critical point well here you have this plateau mm, which should be very very flat of course in real cases, uh, you know, you have to go to very long waiting times to see it being strictly flat, but in the sketch I could make it flat. And uh, so this is the, the sketch of what should happen for very long waiting times, but not infinite waiting times, not scaling with the system size. And, uh, you know, the decays is faster for the shorter waiting times and it's longer, uh, slower for the longer waiting times. And uh, the age in decay is what happens below the plateau. And you also have waiting time dependencies for quenches at the critical point uh, with this envelope that's going down. So we have this separation of time scales, which we call multiplicative, which is multiplicative in the critical quenches and it's additive in the subcritical ones. 
Okay, so this is what is called aging, and uh, it's the property that older samples relax more slowly than uh, younger ones. Uh, T-weighting is the time that measures the age of the system, and there's a huge literature on this phenomenology. Uh, there, as I said, it appears in very different situations as well. So there's even a book by this experimentalist called Spook, who was um, a Dutch uh, physicist on polymer glasses. There's a lot of results also on spin glasses. I will talk about this uh, later on, uh, also on, on all kinds of glasses. And these um, kind of behavior, as I said, uh, you can see it uh, well in spin glasses. This is experimental data. I will talk about this later on. And these are numerical data in Leonard Jones mixtures. So these are like structural glasses with no quench disorder. And you see, okay, the same sort of waiting time dependencies in one case and in the other one. Of course, the forms of the curves are not exactly the same and, and they are not as clean as my sketches above. But um, this is what is observed uh, experimentally and numerically. Now, when you do experiments, uh, you typically uh, prefer to measure response functions, linear response functions, instead of correlation functions. Correlation functions are easy to measure numerically, uh, but they're not so easy to measure experimentally. On the contrary, linear response functions are easy relatively to measure experimentally, but they are not so easy to measure numerically. Uh, so what is a linear response? So it's the response that the system has to an external perturbation. So for example, um, you let it evolve without doing anything and at a certain waiting time, you kick it, kick it in some way. Uh, this means that you modify the Hamiltonian by adding another term, which represents this kick. For example, in a magnetic system, you can apply a magnetic field uh, for a very short time with and with a very small uh, amplitude because you want to make it as small as possible to measure the linear uh, perturbation that it in induces. Of course, you can also make you know, large perturbations, but uh, you prefer to work in the linear regime because it's there that one has um, some theoretical predictions and some understanding of what will happen. So the linear instantaneous response of another observable. So what I mean by this is that, for example, in a magnetic system, you can uh, kick with a, I don't know, a, a field in a direction, and you can see what happens with the magnetization in a different direction. Or you can kick in a direction, and you can see what happens with the magnetization in the same direction. Uh, usually, one perturbs in a certain way and one looks at the response of the same observable that you have used to perturb your system. So in a magnetic system you apply a field in one direction and you look at the magnetization in the same direction. So the linear response function is uh, measured as the variation of the observable that you want to measure due to the change induced by this kick. And this uh, mathematically you write it as the variation of the observable with respect to the variation of the field that you have used to uh, um, modify the Hamiltonian in the limit of the field going to zero. And then you average over you know, thermal noise as, as usual. This is the response to a kick. So I just, you know, at the given waiting time, I put up by applying this field, then I switch it off. And then I measure later on the variation of the observable due to this kick. This is uh, difficult to measure, especially numerically, because the, 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 the signal due to this kick is, is very small, mm? because you have made a very small kick and you want to measure something which is very small. This delta A is very small, so it's very noisy and it's very difficult to average. So what people prefer to do, even analytically actually, is to work with this, what is called the linear integrated response, or you can also call it DC susceptibility, which is the integral over time since the moment at which you start applying the kick and you keep the kick on and you measure uh, you know, how the observable changes uh, all along these times, but with the kick applied. Mm -hmm. So the only thing which is small here is H, the, 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 the amplitude of the magnetic field, let's say. But you, magnetic field, you keep it on. And if linear response, if linearity applies, it, then, 
this um, perturbation is like the sum of all of these perturbations applied, you know, one after the other, one after the other, one after the other one. And then you can just add hmm, the linear responses uh, by integrating over the time uh, the object that uh, you defined before as an instantaneous linear response. So this is the usual uh, definition to, for, for linear responses. And uh, as I said, the choice of the observables with which you will work um, depends on the system you want to study. And uh, usually what works with uh, the same A here and the same A uh, being observed. So linear response functions in this integrated uh, formulation in which you integrate over time uh, satisfy the same kind of scaling as the correlation functions that I showed you before. Uh, these are two time objects because you see there are two times involved. The waiting time where you start perturbing and the time at which you measure that you um, observe uh, along the evolution. And uh, well, you can have these um, uh, multiplicative scaling for the critical coarsening. For the subcritical coarsening, differently from what happens with the correlation functions, there is also a factor here that appears multiplying the scaling function of the ratio of the two lengths at the uh, measuring and waiting time. So there is this uh, extra R here that makes the second contribution to the response function be killed. So remember that in the scaling of the correlation function, there was no factor here. There was just a function of the ratio of the two Rs. So this um, contribution was active, was you know, contributing to the form of the correlation function for all times. Here, since this R of Tw grows with time and there is a negative exponent here, this with time goes to zero. And uh, the only contribution that remains for the correlation function for sufficiently long waiting time is this one. Is this stationary one is like the equilibrium one. So what you can say uh, a little bit unwavingly is that the linear response due to the walls, which is basically what is represented by this second term, uh, goes to zero with time, while the linear response within the domains uh, always remains and is like the equilibrium one. Um, okay, there are reviews about uh, you know these scaling uh, forms of the correlation of the linear response functions. Uh, sorry, uh, for example, okay, I cited some of them here. There is also one that I've written like ten years ago. And something else that has to be said is that if you compare the form of the linear response function in the stationary regime, so for what happens within the domains, uh, which is this first term here, and the correlation in the same time regime, uh, which is what I call C stationary in the other transparency, I'm now I'm calling C egg here, sorry for the change uh, in names, you will realize that they satisfy what is called the fermentation dissipation theorem, which is this relation between the um, uh, integrated response, and there is a typo here in the in the my transparency. I'm sorry, there is no time derivative here. There is a linear relation between the integrated response and the correlation function. There is no derivative. Uh, I will correct this later on. Uh, that is the content of this fluctuation dissipation theorem, which is a property of equilibrium. I will say much more about this later in the third or fourth lecture. Uh, this relation between linear response and correlation function is a property of equilibrium systems independently of their Hamiltonian, independently of uh, you know, what is the macroscopic dynamics. If they are in equilibrium, uh, they satisfy this linear relation between the integrated response and the correlation function. Sorry. Um, we will uh, say much more about this, but I just wanted to mention it here. Instead, what happens you know, in the aging regime in, for longer time, distances, uh, there is no fluctuation dissipation relation between uh, correlations and responses. And this is another evidence for non-equilibrium relaxation in these properties. So for example, uh, how do you see 
this uh, breakdown of the, um, uh, no, sorry, how do you see what's going on with this uh, integrated linear response function as a function of t minus tw? Well, you see these sort of plots. So this upper curve here is for a short waiting time. For a longer waiting time, you will see the next one, then the next one, then the next one, and so on. And you see that what's going on is that basically this linear response is saturating to a form uh, which okay, has some variation for short time distances, and then it's uh, saturating at very long time distances. There is no more contribution of, uh, you know, at long time distances to this integrated linear response. And this is just a manifestation of uh, the fact that this second term, I don't know if you see, this second term is, uh, you know, being killed by this prefactor, and the only thing that remains is the first one. And this is uh, the, what's going to happen if you go to even longer waiting times, you will see curves that will collapse on top of this one, and they will always you know, just go and, and saturate in this way. Let me see what's next. And Okay, so uh, I'm saying a couple of more words about the linear response, and then I go to the chat because I see that there are some questions. So, for coarsening systems, uh, this is uh, in simulations uh, from the group in Salerno, uh, you will see this saturation of the linear response to this plateau. While for glassy problems that I will discuss later on today, uh, you will see that there is an approach to the plateau, but there is also a departure from the plateau in a waiting time dependent manner that goes to a, another asymptotic limit. So, the difference uh, between what we see in glassy systems and what we see in the coarsening problems, uh, which we understand better, is that uh, you have a second contribution to the integrated linear response in the glassy cases that you don't have in the coarsening problems, due to the fact that in the coarsening problems you have this prefactor that kills this contribution, while in the glassy problems you don't. So it's as if in the glassy problems this A would be zero. So this one you don't have, and you have this agent contribution, which remains uh, forever as for the correlation function um, in, in the case of glassy systems. This is an observation. I mean, it's not that I'm explaining why this happens, is that this is what happens. And okay, I'm uh, confronting you to the uh, numerical evidence and experimental evidence, and um, it's something that we still have to understand better, but this is what's going on, and it has been observed again in simulations, experiments, and even in modes. Okay, so let me go to the chat because I have gone to the um, linear response. So, uh, okay, so there is a question about how does the coarsening dynamics differ when one quenches the system across first order phase transitions rather than the second order ones? So let me, now that I have the blackboard, sketch what happens in a first order phase transition. So if you have a first order, case in a Ginsburg Landau picture, uh, what you have is that you have a free energy landscape uh, with this other parameter. That looks like this. You start your system in a metastable state. And you put the system in conditions such that actually the preferred uh, state is another one. So what the system has to do is it has to jump over this barrier. So in real space, again, if I do my uh, magnetic example, this would mean that the system is magnetized negatively and it wants to become positively magnetized. So everywhere the system is uh, down in its initial configuration and it has to flip globally 
to go in the other direction. Now, what will happen is that because of thermal fluctuations, so I have to be at temperature different from zero, uh, there will be droplets created somewhere with the uh, magnetization that this minimum is telling the system that it should have because it's lower in free energy density than that one. But if these nuclei, they are called, are not sufficiently large, because of the cost of creating a wall, you know, between uh, the positively and the negatively magnetized state, this has a cost. It has a surface tension, if you wish, or has a, you know, a cost in energy. So because of that, the system will make it disappear. It's not good enough to turn around, uh, you know, what's within. You don't gain enough free energy because of making a small bubble of this order within the background. So this one will reverse, that one will reverse, but another one will appear somewhere else. What you can do with that easy estimate uh, that I'm not going to do in the blackboard because it would take me time and take me beyond my uh, the subject of my talk is that you need to build a sufficiently large bubble so that the gain that you have because of going to the you know this other uh, minimum is sufficiently important and then once you have created this big bubble this big bubble will grow and they will it will conquer the full sample. So it's not that interesting as a phenomenon for, from my point of view uh, of this lecture uh, to discuss nucleation. This is the way in which this uh, phenomenon is called. So for the moment, I don't want to discuss it in more detail than that because it's, um, yeah, it's like another uh, phenomenology. Uh, hi, in practice, we like measuring susceptibility in Fourier space. Yes, uh, this is my I'm more precise. Yes, I absolutely agree. And uh, salut, Antoine. <laughs> so uh, the, um, we can also write, you know, the scaling functions uh, using frequency and waiting time. So the frequency is sort of playing the role of the um, time difference. And then you have also two scaling variables to work with. So I'm working in the time domain. So I was working with this pair of times. So now if you work as Antoine is saying in the frequency domain, uh, then uh, you, you fully transform with respect to the time difference, but you still have the waiting time dependence. So um, you can work with this pair and, and, and do scaling arguments of the kind I was using. So then short time differences corresponds to high frequencies. While, uh, you know, low frequencies corresponds to, um, sorry, yeah, low frequencies corresponds to long uh, time distances. Will these uh, FDTs also follow from the Langevin like equation for the fields? Uh, yes, yes, indeed. So there are ways, uh, I don't think I will have a lot of time to discuss them, but I can give you references. Uh, so you can prove these uh, FDTs in equilibrium for Langevin dynamics. You can also prove it for Hamiltonian dynamics, by the way. So the important thing is that you start from equilibrium, then you evolve either with Langevin or with the uh, Hamilton dynamics, and uh, you will prove this, um, equilibrium FDTs. Of course, the, the Langevin dynamics has to satisfy detail balance. Otherwise, uh, you break you know, the equilibrium situation by uh, using a dynamics that goes beyond equilibrium. So the uh, friction and the temperature of the uh, Langevin equation, uh, you know, the friction term, sorry, and the um, noise noise correlations have to be uh, related uh, in, a, in a special way uh, so that you don't break the balance. How to differentiate between coarsening and glass? Yeah, this is a good question. So the what we have in mind is that uh, the linear responses are telling you the difference. So 
of course, I mean, maybe this is not true, and maybe there is some growth which is hidden in, in the glassy physics as well, and uh, we just haven't identified it. And it's a kind of growth that makes uh, the second contribution to the linear response uh, be non killed in a long time wa waiting time limit. This I don't know. But for the moment, uh, you know, for all the coarsening systems that we know and all the glassy problems that we know, there is a difference, and it is in the way in which the linear response behaves. In the slide on aging plots, uh, what is the meaning of additive and multiplicative? But it's just that the correlation function, you know, you, you let me show it again. I have to do this. Well, here, okay. So, uh, up, you see here the equilibrium contribution uh, to the linear response or to the correlation function in the critical quenches appears multiplying this other scaling function of the ratios of the, the Rs. Well, here in the subcritical coarsening, the equilibrium contribution appears additively, so summed to the other one, added to the, 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 the second part. It's just that it's representing the equations. Let me see if there is. Uh, I think I answered all the questions. Yes. Okay, so now about mean field models. Uh, why do we talk about mean field models? Well, because we can solve them. <laughs> so the, the, the Ginsburg Landau equation is perfectly okay for uh, these, uh, you know, scalar uh, coarsening systems, but uh, you, okay, you cannot solve it analytically. But um, there are other, other kind of uh, systems which capture part of the coarsening phenomenology, which are completely solvable and analytical. So you can do lots of uh, nice calculations and, uh, for example, uh, recover this, this kind of scaling hmm, for the two time correlations and the other one, uh, corresponding one for the correlation functions analytically. So this is nice. So one of the models that we like to, to work with uh, is this P equals two spherical model, we call it, or we also call it a spherical sharing of the Patrick model. And we'll say more about this in the last lecture if, if I have time to, to discuss this problem. Um, let me just, okay, don't say much more about this, just to tell you that there is a sum here in all these mean field models which um, we deal with, the, the essential point that makes the mean field, hence not so much realistic, but solvable, is that we put the uh, spins on a complete graph instead of on a lattice. So uh, the complete graph means that each spin is connected to all the other ones in the sample in a similar way. There is no notion of distance. This is what uh, the fully connected interactions mean. And um, uh, well, okay, there is a way to build these interactions. Are you changing slides? Sorry? Are, have you changed any slides? Have I changed? Slides? I, I don't are you I'm... moving the, uh, between slides or you're uh, still on the plan of this lecture slide? Uh, I'm on these slides, yes. Why? Uh. No, I, I thought uh, the question was like, uh, you're, you're not changing slides, right? Not now, no. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I will, I will change my slides in a second, but not, not, not yet. Yeah. Um, so, okay, there is a way to choose these interactions here, uh, such that this problem, which is a problem of fully connected spins, uh, coupled in some way, I will discuss it even more detail later on, uh, reproduces the phenomenology of uh, the coarsening problem. So, I will jump over this for the moment. The ON model is a more standard one, uh, for those of you uh, who know it. Um, it's an extension of this Ginsburg-Landau problem, where instead of working with the scalar field, you make it a vector field, and you take the number of components of this field to go to infinity. Okay, I jump over this uh, again, it's just to flash you the kind of problems that we can solve analytically. Uh, this is a summary of uh, what I said, this multiplicative scaling at the critical point. Uh, Leticia, the yeah? uh, we can't see your slides changing. Ah. ah, this is what, no, I don't know why. 
Uh, ah, because my screen sharing is paused. I don't know why. Uh, what should I do? Okay. Hmm. Okay, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to change slides, actually. Ah, yes, this is what you say. The, yeah. Uh, because in any case, I wanted to go to the disorder problem now. So I will stop sharing this file. Okay. I will open the other one. Okay. So uh, just to make a summary, uh, you know, uh, with the, with words uh, about the course ending path that I, that I discussed. So I gave you the phenomenology, I gave you this dynamic scaling. At the end, I was showing you some models that we know how to solve. Um, it's not that important, just in, in two words, is what we call ON problems, where uh, what we do, instead of working with a field which was a scalar, we upgrade it to a vector and this vector has n components. And in the end, going to infinity limit, which is in principle non realistic, but okay, we can do it analytically. Uh, the Ginsburg Landau problem becomes solvable. And it becomes solvable, and uh, we can compute correlation functions in time, but also we can compute correlation functions in space because this space dimension, let's call it D, uh, remains finite in our calculation. And then, you know, we can compute all these scaling functions and see that the scaling functions satisfy the type of scalings, uh, these correlation functions, sorry, satisfy the type of uh, scalings that I had been discussing. But, okay, this would take me some time to, to do it um, analytically. Um, it's not, you know, central to my talk. Uh, it's just calculations. This can be done. And uh, if you want references, I can give you references. In any case, the references on the, um, for example, the Alan Bray's uh, review article does it in, in full detail. Now, what I want to do is change a little bit subject and uh, discuss problems with quench interactions, quench randomness or disorder uh, within the definitions of the Hamiltonians. So let me try to um, first tell you which is the plan of, of these lectures. Of course, this field is very large and I could spend you know, 10 days talking about this. So I have to select certain um, problematics and certain properties and certain features, uh, which and uh, the idea is to go towards, you know, glassiness and, and try to understand a little bit which are the differences between glassy problems and, and simple coarsening ones as the ones that I discussed before. So I will give you definitions and examples, some properties, lists of methods used in theory. But of course, I mean, I cannot discuss them all. I will just focus on what is called Paulus anderson palmer equations, which is the extension of the Ginsburg-Landau um, way of thinking uh, to problems which went randomness. And these give us access to what are called the free energy landscapes, complex free energy landscapes due to this disorder. So it's going beyond Ginsburg-Landau in the sense of being more complex than Ginsburg-Landau. And then I will tell you something about relaxation dynamics as uh, observed in experiments and numerics. I have already shown you some data in the previous slides with the comparison with the coarsening systems. And then I give you some ideas of how we can understand these problems, attack these problems uh, from the theoretical point of view. So what is randomness? Well, randomness is always linked to uh, impurities or imperfections in the, um, in the system. So let me see there is a comment. Uh, more chat. Uh, uh, what happens when one rapidly hit a system rather than cooling? Do the domains of preferred phase grow in similar way as in the rapid cooling? Well, it depends if you hit it up, you know, if you hit above the critical points, you disorder the sample very quickly because the dynamics above in the disorder phase is typically very fast. 
if you start from an equilibrium condition at zero temperature and you heat it up below more thermal fluctuations within the domains. So the domain is already built at zero temperature. You just you know, fluctuate a little bit. So it's not so interesting in general to heat up as it is to cool down from a disorder configuration. OK, go back to randomness. So you have these impurities, could be you know, vacancies, substitutions, uh, amorphous structures, I don't know, many, many different things um, that make the material imperfect in a sense, uh, make it disordered. Uh, now, there are different kinds of disorders. There is what we call weak randomness or weak disorder, in which case the effect of disorder is weak and the phase diagram is respected in the sense that it remains the same. You can move a little bit the critical points. You can change a little bit the position of the critical lines in the phase space, in phase diagram, sorry. But you know, the phases remain the same and the criticality may change. So for example, you can change a problem with a first order phase transition into one with a second order phase transition. Typically it's smooth. The, the kind of phase transition. So it goes from first to second. Um, but, uh, but the nature of the phases uh, remains the same. So this is kind of the definition of weak randomness. You don't change the, the morphology, let's say, of the phase diagram, but you may change the criticality. And then there is the case of strong randomness, where even the phases are modified. Those are more difficult to understand, of course, because sometimes you don't even know which is the new order phase or whether you have killed the other phase of the problem, which originally didn't have randomness by including the randomness. And the second distinction, which is important, is that uh, you can have what is called annealed disorder. So disorder, which is also fluctuating, and this is easier to deal with and uh, maybe in a different time scale from the one of the variables that you want to focus on, but say that it's still changing in time, while what is called quench disorder is frozen. So it doesn't move, it doesn't flip, it's just fixed in time over the all, whole time scale that you can explore experimentally or numerically. And this is harder to deal with uh, analytically, but it's also more interesting. So, by this, um, when I say fluctuating or uh, frozen, what I'm just saying is that imagine that you have a microscopic time scale, you have an observation time scale, which is the one of the experiments, and you have a time scale over which the disorder can fluctuate. So, if the uh, time scale for which the disorder can fluctuate uh, is, uh, you know, much longer than the observational time scale, the disorder is frozen and then it remains fixed and uh, you know, it has an effect on the other variables on which you want to uh, focus on. Uh, and of course, it, you know, it may change their behavior, it may change the phases and so on and so forth. So these are the kinds of classification that are, uh, are made and the names and yield and quench uh, come from metallurgy, of course, uh, you know, what we do with the preparation of metals and so on and so forth. So we are going to focus in these lectures on, on the effect of quench disorder. So the variables are frozen in time scales over which other variables can fluctuate. So the disorder ones are frozen, the other ones fluctuate. Again, this is the same order of time scales that I mentioned before. And just to give examples, uh, the, the, this equilibration time scale for the disorder could be the diffusion time for magnetic impurities in a magnetic system. Um, or it could be the flipping time of those impurities uh, which create random fields acting on the other magnetic variables on which you want to focus on. Um, I have already said that weak disorder modifies the critical properties, perhaps, but not the phases, and the strong disorder modifies both. So the distinction between weak and strong disorder is made in examples by the cases of what we call random ferromagnets. So there, instead of having all the JIJs, all the interactions between the spin being equal, you can have different values of the JIJs fixed 
but all positive. This is what we call a random ferromagnet. So the low temperature phase will still be a ferromagnet uh, and the critical properties uh, will be possibly modified, but not the phases, not the paramagnet and the ferromagnet. Well, in a spin glass problem, the JIJs uh, will be able to take different values with different signs as well. And this is what we are going to discuss later on. And the low temperature phase then is a spin glass and then we don't know that much about it apart from in the mean field uh, cases. So, so um, yes. the, uh, JIGs are uh, short range only, right? Or yeah, yeah. You will, I, I will give you the, the precise uh, form of the JIJs for the realistic spin glasses in a couple of slides. About this weak disorder, I mean, if JIJs are long range, then weak disorder also, I mean, it's just critical properties will change, but not the phase. Is that mm -hmm. the Yes, yes. If you if you keep them with the same sign, with positive signs, uh, yeah, you will. Okay. Okay, so the simplest example of um, problems with quench randomness are of geometric nature. So they are random graphs and percolation. You've probably heard about both uh, in your studies. So a random graph, okay, is a set of points that you join with some probabilistic um, prescription. And uh, like this, you construct a graph. So for example, you say you give a probability, low probability to draw a link between uh, pairs of uh, sites. And then you will have something like this, a random graph, uh, which is very sparse. Or if you take a high probability to join the, uh, si the sites, you will have something like uh, the red um, figure over here. Uh, of course, if you take P to be one, everybody will be connected to everyone, everybody else. So this is a construction of random graphs. And this is an example which went randomness because once you have made a link, you don't kill it. And then the thing remains uh, as um, at the, initial time of the construction, let's say, after the construction uh, forever. Another problem is the case of, uh, you know, percolation. So it's similar to the previous one. You have a lattice, uh, you, you know, delete links, for example. You have a complete lattice, you delete links with some probability. Then you have a, a very sparse, like here, or more connected, like there. Uh, uh, dilute uh, lattice. And then you may ask questions about, you know, can I go from one end to the other one by following these links? And these are the kind of questions that you ask in percolation theory. And this again is a problem with quench randomness in, in the sense that, you know, once you have built your lattice, you don't change it. But okay, we are interested in, in problems in physics where you have energies. And uh, then the, the example of the spin glass comes uh, next. So what is a spin glass? So you prepare a mixture typically of two kinds of magnetic components. You cool it down below some temperature and one kind of the uh, components uh, say that it has a diffusive time which is very long. So after some very short time, all these magnetic impurities remain fixed remain fixed in space. And imagine that they also remain fixed their magnetic orientation, their magnetic moment. So you will have something like what is sketched here. So you have uh, these spins, which occupy fixed positions. They will not be able to move any longer within the sample, but they will not be able to flip either. So you have these magnetic fields created by these magnetic impurities that are uh, pointing in directions uh, determined by the preparation of the sample and that they won't move anymore. So uh, these are the magnetic impurities within say some host. And uh, then uh, you can say, uh, well, let's take the situation in which the motion of these magnetic impurities is frozen during all times of observation. But let's imagine that the flipping of these magnetic impurities is possible. So this is the case indeed of the spin glasses. So you have these random positions, but possibility to flip during the observation time. So then the interactions from you know, condensed matter theory between those spins is ruled by what are called 
RKKY um, uh, potential. So this RKKY potential is uh, of this following form. So you have the two spins in question, in interaction, and then you have a prefactor here, which depends on the distance between those spins. But since the distance between those spins is random, because there's no order in the position of the spins, it's just you know some randomly chosen distances uh, determined at the preparation of the sample. Then you have here in the numerator something which is a cosine of a random object, R i j. And this will differ very much so, you know, with the different pairs of spins that you choose to look at, the different ij's, uh, which are the indices labeling the spins. And the cosine doesn't have a sign defined. So depending on who is this R i j, uh, you will have cosines which are positive so cosines which are negative so you can have you know potential energies of both signs here and then you have a factor which is this r cubed which is telling you how these uh, interactions decay with distance and decay well okay relatively fast like a power law uh, with a power of three uh, in three dimensions so it's uh, you know something that which is um, short range from this point of view so there are very rapid oscillations around zero with distance because of this cosine they can be positive and negative because of the cosine again and there is this well, slow power law decay uh, with distance okay so you see the quench nature is in the r i j's here and the randomness is because, okay, they occupy random positions uh, fixed at the preparation of the sun. Um, okay, let me go a little bit ahead before going to the chat and the questions. So um, how to model this problem? Of course, if you want to deal with the actual problem, you have to deal with these actual interactions and with these actual you know, random positions of the impurities. But this is very difficult. So what Edwards and Anderson did uh, in the 70s is to propose a simpler model of this same situation, which is called the Edwards-Anderson model. So instead of working with this actual interaction between the spins with this prefactor here, what they say is, let's put the spins on a lattice. So there's no more random positions uh, of the spins, but let's say that the interactions between the pairs of spins is controlled by an interaction uh, coupling constant, uh, Jij, which we will be drawn from a probability distribution with zero mean and finite variance. Okay, so, you know, by draw, for example, take a Gaussian distribution of the Jij's centered at zero and with some variance. You pick a pair of spins, you pick the Jij that couples those spins, it will take a value, say, I don't know, 0 0.7. Then you take another pair of spins, you again draw a Jij from the probability distribution of Gaussian kind, you will get a Jij which is equal to minus 0 0.5, let's say, and so on and so forth. So you build the model by drawing these Jij's from the probability distribution that you chose, and you fix them in that way, and then they don't change any longer. But you see that the JIJs which are here uh, take different values with different signs in this construction. So this is the prescription given by Edward Anderson to build a simpler model of a thin glass which hopefully captures still all the properties of the one in the previous transparency. This one here which was much more difficult to deal with. Still, this model is very difficult to deal with, of course. It's very difficult to deal with analytically, uh, but it's also quite hard to, to control numerically with the Monte Carlo simulations, but okay, there's a huge literature around it. And it's, this is the standard model of uh, spin glass uh, problems, accepted as you know, the good model for spin glasses. So spin glasses are difficult to, to, um, to study. Uh, the, I just, this is a quote from, uh, radio article by Dan Schein. Uh, so the traits arise from disorderly, discordant magnetic interactions among atoms. Magnetic, ma sorry, mathematical models of spin glasses are prototypes for complex problems in computer science, neurology, and evolution. Indeed, because Hamiltonians of this kind will appear in very different areas of uh, maths, 
computer science, uh, even biology. So I will give you some examples now. So neural networks. What are neural networks? They are models for the um, <clears throat> neurons in the brain, let's say. And the standard model for neural networks is the Hopfield model, proposed in the 80s, roughly. So it's a model in which you say the activity of a neuron, the state of a neuron, will be modeled by easing spins. So the neuron is either active when it's firing or is non-active when it's quiescent. And let's associate this to spin up, spin down, hmm? the two possibilities. The neurons are uh, living typically on a random graph, a rather sparse random graph. And this, okay, it's uh, experimental observation. So, in the connections between the neurons, uh, what you will have to deal with is instead of a lattice, a graph. Okay, we know how to build graphs and that's fine. Now, what are the interactions between the neurons? Well, they are the synapses, right? So the synapses, uh, you can say that they are links on this random graph, linking the, the neurons. So uh, these are the JIJs that mimic those synapses. Now, what you will say is that, okay, you want your neural network to be able to retrieve information that has been stored in your memory, the memory of the brain. And what Hoffel did is to propose a choice of these JIJs that is able to mimic, you know, the retrieval mechanism of uh, the uh, way in which uh, the, the, the neural networks work. So you give them information that they store and then they're able to retrieve this information um, uh, in their functioning. So the way in which uh, Hochschild modeled this uh, um, storage uh, capacity or storage possibility of the neurons is to say that the JIJs are made by a sum of the patterns, we call them patterns, that they memorize. And uh, so this is the representation given by this sum over mu from one to np. This is a number of patterns. Mu is the index that labels the patterns. And xi, i, mu, are the patterns. So what it means a patterns, it means that the way to store it is to say that the neurons, um, um, the neurons have a certain uh, configuration of activities that correspond to pattern number one. So let's say pattern number one corresponds to neuron number one firing, neuron number two quiescent, neuron number three firing. So then this psi of pattern number one, mu equals to one, corresponds to psi one up, psi one down, psi one th three uh, up. So by choosing this kind of um, you know, JIJs uh, to put here and letting these spins fluctuate, evolve in time with uh, the uh, stochastic evolution that we can give them, then what will happen is that uh, the spins will converge to these pattern configurations in the course of time if you, um, if you, if you, um, uh, how to say it, if you, if you show to the network um, a, a configuration that corresponds to the pattern that it has to recognize. So, uh, okay, this is just a way of uh, modeling uh, the functioning of neural networks. And where is the randomness here? Well, what Hopfield said is to say, okay, let's not give any special structure to the patterns that the networks have to recognize. And then let's choose the size I mu from some probability distribution with some uh, mean and with some variance, say mean zero and variance finite. And then the randomness is in good size, which induces a randomness in the JIJs and which induces the quench disorder into the whole mode. Okay. So this is the standard model actually of neural networks. And then you can modify it a little bit by uh, you know, choosing the structure of the network and choosing the kind of dynamics that you will give to the SIs. Uh, but apart from that, you know, this is the, the standard uh, problem. And it's very similar to a spin glass problem. You see, apart from the fact that instead of choosing the JJs directly from the probability distribution, you choose the patterns from probability distribution. But then the JJs are random as well. 
Uh, Ma'am, uh, here Zaya is are stored in ith uh, neuron, is it? And then no, the Xia's are uh, the 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 JIJs live on the links. Hmm? The the JIJs lives on the links, but the Xia's are uh, you know the activities of the neurons. So it's a bit of uh, but they are fixed. You you fix them, and then you want to see whether your configurations of the spins can converge to can approach in the long time limit, let's say, uh, the configurations identical to the size. So you want to know whether with the dynamics that you give to the spins, uh, say that the, you start from some SI of zero, you evolve in time, and you want to know whether in time this goes to, say, this thing here with mu equals to some value. So mu one, for example, this is pattern one. This is memory number one, but then you can you have the other ones. SI can take only between zero and one, right? Uh, then, uh, like yeah. mu is an additional, some internal degree of freedom. I I am not able to follow this. Yes. So the uh, it, it, for easing spins, the SIs are plus or minus one, and then you choose the SIs to also be plus or minus one, and uh, and then then you know you can ask the question whether you converge to those size to those size here so like what is the role of mu mu is basically number of patterns you said yes yes mu is the index of the patterns so uh, it's just you know you want to, your network to be able to memorize many patterns because if it memorizes only one it's a bit silly as a network <laughs> so you want to know you know you want to build a, a, a network that it's able to store NP patterns. Uh, and then uh, you can ask, for example, this is a question that was asked in the 80s, uh, for a given model of a neural network, how many patterns you can store? And this is called the capacity of the network. And typically, the capacity of the network uh, is something that scales with the number of spins that the, or neurons, better said, that the net network has. So this number of patterns typically uh, is some refactor times n with alpha some number, you know, smaller than one typically. Okay. Or not. I mean, they're just a number. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Uh, excuse me, ma'am. Yes. Uh, so um, so when you say that the size are on the links that means that as the number of uh, i mean the capacity of the entire network increases meaning that the number of links between the different uh, uh, spins uh, that increases uh, well okay i don't know if i understood your question but you have these jijs are uh, what tell you let me raise here So you have a random graph. I don't know, something like this. Uh, okay, let's say this is your random graph. So this is neuron I, this is neuron J, and then you have the JIJ hmm, that links the two, two neurons. In a spin glass problem, you, you would have chosen this JIJ from a probability distribution. Gaussian kind and, and that's it. And you build your spin glass on this network. For the neural network problem, what you do is that this one is constructed in this way. And this is the Hoptil uh, prescription based on the head rule that head even in the, I don't know, the 40s perhaps, uh, long ago, uh, proposed that the memory was stored in the interactions, was stored in the connections of the, um, of the neural networks. So what you propose, this is a definition, that the JIJ will be given of this form. And then you choose this, uh, to make the calculations possible and to make them, you know, the, um, the, the neural tractable, the network tractable, you propose that these psi i's are taken from a probability distribution. Uh, that, uh, as somebody told me, since the s's are using variables, okay, you have to take the size to be using 
type as well, bimodal variables as well. So uh, this one, you take it to be a bimodal PDF. And, uh, and like this, you build the, the model. OK, thank so, you. Some, you're welcome. So, something that I didn't say is that uh, in the real networks, the interactions are not symmetric. Hmm? So in the real uh, brain, the effect of this neuron on this one is not the same as the one of this one on that one. And typically, actually, they are directional, these effects. So this one has an effect on that one, but this one has absolutely no effect on the other one. So this forbids the possibility of writing a Hamiltonian for the problem, right? Because if JIJ is non-symmetric, the non-symmetric part of the JIJ disappears from the Hamiltonian, you see? Because this um, SISJ is symmetric with respect to the exchange of I and J. And I have a sum over all pairs of I and J's here. So if this one has an anti-symmetric part, the sum makes it zero. So there is no contribution to the Hamiltonian of anti-symmetric or asymmetric, uh, yeah, the anti-symmetric parts of the interactions. Uh, okay, this is a problem in this uh, Hamiltonian writing of the Hopkin model. But if you just focus on the evolution, then you can deal with uh, these uh, anti-symmetric contributions. I'm not going to say more about that. Let's just you know, stop here about the discussion on the neural networks because I don't want to spend so much time on this. But um, OK, this is something that it has to be mentioned with respect to the comparison of the Hopkin model to the uh, actual networks. Let me see what time is it. OK, 10 minutes. Another example, which is very much studied in the literature, is, for example, the motion of interfaces uh, over impurities. So for, imagine that you have a, an interface between oil and water, and that you have some impurities, some, I don't know, obstacles. So if you want to, say, push the interface uh, along the x direction of my groin here, uh, imagine that the interface is blocked, is stopped by those impurities, and then you have to, you know, exert a very strong force to make it move beyond, say, this red dot over there. Uh, and uh, OK, this is a set of problems that has been studied so much and is still studied a lot. The literature has applications in uh, vortex uh, superconductors and okay, many other uh, situations. Um, so it's the name that is given to this sort of uh, problems is spinning by impurities. And OK, they can say many things about it, but I'm not going to discuss them. Just I give the example. So in the last 10 minutes I have, let me give you some, some properties of these disorder systems. So first thing, which is rather obvious, is that there is a special inhomogeneity now in the uh, Hamiltonians or in the real systems. Why so? Because, OK, in the spin glass, uh, Example, it was very obvious that you know there were regions where there were more impurities, let's say, regions where there are less impurities. So the system is not homogeneous in space. There is another property which is frustration. I will define it in a second. Probably the distributions uh, are uh, the basis of the constructions of those um, models, and one has to be careful about the normalizations of those probability distributions. And another property which is called self-averageness is very important as well. Okay, so. At the, heterogeneity or inhomogeneity. In the models, uh, the JIJs are taken from a probability distribution, so they are not all equal in space. One way to quantify these fluctuations in space is to focus on what is called the local field. So what is the local field? Well, in a system with interactions between nearest neighbors on a lattice, it's just the sum over the nearest neighbors of the pinpointed spin that you want to look at, on which acts this local field of the JIJs times the value, the, the value sorry, of the neighboring spin. So let's say here, for example. Here, I focus on the central spin. Imagine that all the neighbors are up and that, okay, you have um, uh, equal interactions between those um, neighbors here, so that they are all equal to J for some reason. You pick them in this way. 
So then the local field that this one feels is because of this, that, that, and that interaction is just equal to 4J, let's say. And uh, if I go somewhere else and that the same situation arises, then I will also get 4J. So, okay, this is an example of an homogeneous situation. But if I come here and I look at this pin, this pin sees, uh, if you do the counting, a uh, local field which is equal to minus 2j. Because these two cancel, these two contributions, and these two add up to minus um, 2j, let's say. I am considering all the j's to be the same in this example. But then, okay, here I will feel if I, all the j's are the same because of this, uh, uh, yeah, because of this um, configuration, I will feel a field which is zero. And here I will feel a field which is two j's. So, of the different spins, different neighboring spin configurations on the central one on which I'm focusing, and just do the calculation simple, I'm taking all the j's to be equal. If I would take the same configuration, but with different interactions, I would see that, you know, because of the different interactions, I will see different local fields as well. So this is what I mean by heterogeneous um, uh, heterogeneity, that, that the, you know, the situations in different places in the, in the, in the samples will be different. Okay, what is frustration? Frustration is the fact that if you have uh, different signs in the interactions between the nearest neighbor spins, you can face situations in which you cannot minimize the energy locally. So what do I mean by this? Let's take this triangular plaquette here. Imagine that you have a lattice, which is a triangular one, and that all the interactions are negative between the nearest neighbors on this triangular plaquette. Imagine that this is your Hamiltonian, all the JIJs are negative, so minus minus makes it plus. So the spins want to be anti-aligned because of these anti-ferromagnetic interactions between the neighbors. But then what, let me do it on the platform. So all the interactions are negative and they impose anti-alignment alignment, uh, or uh, anti-ferromagnetic order. So let's imagine that I start by placing this spin here in the positive direction. I come. And I look at this interaction, which tells me to put this one in the negative direction. And then I come here and I see that because of this interaction, I have to put it in the positive direction. But then I notice that these two spins are aligned in the same direction. And this is not good because this gives a positive contribution to the energy, to the local energy. So this is positive. So what we say is that this link is frustrated. This one here with this configuration. Now you can say, okay, uh, let me turn around in this direction and do the same construction. So let me try to see whether I can find a configuration that satisfies all three links. And you will soon realize that this is not possible because I start from here, I move here, I put it down. I move here, I put it up. And then I realized that this one is frustrated because these two are up. So you see, for this kind of uh, triangular configuration, triangular um, geometry of the plaquette, uh, with these antiferromagnetic interactions between the spins, there is no way to find a configuration that doesn't have one link 
um, at least one link broken, we also say, or unsatisfied or frustrated. So uh, this is very typical of problems which quench randomness. Here, all the interactions were the same, but uh, you can convince yourselves that if you have a problem, um, so let me erase or maybe move, just I'll finish with this transparency, but let me move here. And it's very simple to see that if you have whatever your graph is, if you make a loop on your graph and the interactions are such that the product of the JIJs in the loop is negative, then uh, the configuration will be frustrated in the sense that there will necessarily be one link which is uh, unsatisfied. So you can do this kind of um, examples yourself, build them, and uh, you, know, you have to have easing spins and you have to have that the product of the JIJs over this loop is negative, independently of the values of uh, the JIJs. There could be continuous variables and, uh, you know, take real uh, values. But if the product of these are negative, uh, you will face a situation like here, like one of the links will be unsatisfied. So um, you cannot satisfy all coupling simultaneously if the product over the loop of the JIJs is negative. And the consequences, uh, last comment, of uh, there being frustration in the problem is that typically the energy of the ground state is higher than if you were in the same situation with the same JIJs, but no frustration. So imagine that for the same loop, you take the same JIJs, but you change the sign of one to make this product positive. Then you can see that the energy of uh, the ground state of the plaquette with no fluctuation, with no frustration will be lower than the energy of the plaquette with frustration. And something else you can see is that the entropy, the number of configurations that are ground states uh, in the frustrated case is higher than in the non-frustrated case. So you can do also do with the examples yourself and you can convince yourself that this is also true. Uh, higher or equal, hmm, because maybe you have only one, but uh, certainly uh, you know, in the direction of being higher. So it changes the properties of the ground states uh, in the sense of making you know, the energies spectrum pushed up and also the um, properties of the numbers of configurations which are ground states. Uh, so now I think it's time to close. Uh, yeah, I can close here because the next property will be the self-averageness. I will discuss that one tomorrow first thing. In, uh, I will start with that one. So let me know if you have questions. Let me see if there are questions in the chat. Uh, yes, there are some. So, uh, okay, so there was a question about the heating, which I have already answered. So can you please define the term quench again? Is it the same as you were using earlier? Exactly. So as I said yesterday that there is always a little bit of confusion between the uses of the word quench uh, when you come to the field, because there are two ways in which quench is, is used. So, so there is one way of using the word, which is uh, this fast cooling uh, of a system, which is what I was using yesterday and at the beginning of the lecture today, when I was talking about the coarsening and I say, okay, I take an initial condition, I change the conditions of the bath with which the system is in contact and I perform a quench uh, of the system in this way. So this is the first one. And then there is the other way uh, which I'm using now, uh, which is related to disorder, uh, which is frozen. So this has to do with uh, couplings or 
parameters in the Hamiltonian. which are fixed and don't fluctuate. The second one. Well, the first one has to do with the, the dynamical process that you do, you know, something that you do to your system. So you cool it down quickly. So it's unfortunate because it's, uh, you know, the, 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 the two are used in, in the literature and uh, you know this words that one has to get used to it and be able to distinguish <laughs> what is meant in the, according to the context uh, okay what is the form of lattice in Hochfeld model for neural nets okay it's a random graph so then it depends uh, a little bit on you know whether you really want to uh, describe the actual structure of moduli in the brain uh, the kind of connectivity that you have to uh, use so it's a random graph with a low connectivity basically uh, that is if you want to describe real life. Then if you want to do calculations, um, well, at the beginning, in the 80s, people were just using fully connected graphs. Uh, now, with techniques which have been developed uh, in the theory of spin glasses, um, it, people can deal with uh, sparse uh, random graphs uh, very easily with very powerful techniques. Is the frustration case, if I have a quantum spin, then is it possible to have some superposition state that will avoid the frustration? Uh, uh, no, I don't think so. So, so there is a lot of uh, activity in frustrated magnets in particular. So the kind of things that are sketched here. So for example, the antiferromagnets on a triangular lattice, uh, you can deal with it classically. And okay, it was done by Vanier and uh, you know, classical people in the 50s. Uh, but there is a huge activity in the uh, context of um, you know condensed matter theory uh, in the present days uh, because it has to do with superconductivity and so on so people are dealing with uh, quantum frustrated magnets and they have these properties of uh, you know um, uh, macroscopic um, well okay entropies of ground states uh, which uh, scale with the system size and so on and so forth so the, the, these properties are still present in quantum systems how is the product of JIJ negative for the triangle? Uh, well, if you take the three here, if you take the three couplings to be minus J, so say that this one is minus J with J positive or minus modulus of J, let's say, minus modulus of J. Uh, let me write, I'll write it well. And the same here. Then I do the product of the three and I get minus one to the three modulus of J minus modulus of J. So the product is negative. Can you see it? Uh, yes? Uh, I got one question. So uh, in the easing case, when we quench the season from high temperature to uh, uh, below the crater temperature, we know that the uh, equilibrium time will scale with the uh, system size in a power law relation. Yes. So uh, what about in the uh, uh, spin glass, uh, the Edward Anderson model or the SK model, when we quench the system from high temperature, then the time needed to uh, reach a mm -hmm. uh, spin glass space? Uh, yeah, that's, that, 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 that's a more difficult question. Uh, so um, this K model, it's... <sighs> okay, so... In the scale model, uh, the particular thing it has is that it doesn't have higher line. Okay, I'm getting a little bit technical here. I guess that you know about this. But the scale model does not have metastable states above the ground state um, um, level, let's say, uh, which are confining. So it, it, there are metastable states, but they always have a lot of negative directions through which the system can, can, can relax. So uh, in the scale model for the energy density you can relatively quickly not with times scaling with l 
get very close to the energy density of the ground state. But then if you want to know about the actual configurations of the spins, whether you are really at the ground state, you know, looking more carefully about, then it, it's a very difficult question. So there has been uh, a set of papers by Andrea Montanari and collaborators in Stanford uh, from the sort of mathematical side, uh, although he's a physicist by training, but he has become quite mathematical, um, where they have bounds and estimates for this time scale to, to reach equilibrium in the SK model. So I suggest you to look at those papers. At the same time, I know that there was, I don't know if a paper, but some comments from Parisi and, and his people in Rome, uh, a, a little bit discussing this uh, claims by, by Andrea. So uh, that that's a, a very, very hard, question. So I, I don't think it has a, you know, a precise answer. And then it depends on the kind of algorithm that you use. So Andrea was devising special algorithms to speed up the relaxation when you want to really know about the configurations of the spins compared to the ground state ones. Okay, thank you. Uh, an another question is that uh, we are talking about the quench randomness, which means that the JIJ doesn't change with time. Uh, so what if I have some, uh, so in Completely in your case, we know that the ground state is something like a disorder ferro magnet. But what if ha I have some very slow dynamics of the JIJ? Then, uh, the yeah, dynamic th th that's also an, uh, an interesting problem. Uh, there were some papers by Heinz Horner in the 90s, I think, about the case where you also have some annealing of the uh, of the JIJs, and you have to deal with the time scales uh, of evolution of the two um, of the two types of variables in different ways for the dynamics. Uh, but I think that the problem has come back to to life recently, uh, again concerning you know. Um, applications in, in different fields, but I, I don't know exactly, uh, you know, many references to, to suggest, but I can check, I can check in the literature. Uh, what... Okay, okay, thank you. No, you know, how you, how you deal with the two. Uh, yeah, there were some papers by, by Jorge Kurchan and uh, people in Italy who were playing with the uh, annealed interactions uh, recently. So I, I'll, I'll check the references and I'll send them to you. This reminds okay. me that I, that I was also, because of the questions I got yesterday and uh, that I said that I was going to send references and so on, I was preparing a, a file yesterday with answers to those questions and references. I will you know, complete it with uh, your question and um, I will uh, maybe send it to the organizers so that they can you know, publish it in, in the webpage of the school and, and everybody can look at them. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Leticia, uh, uh, sorry, there was another question. Uh, yes. no. um, hello, I've got a question. Um, in this present slide, what does the notation S mean on the right hand side? Here? This one? Yeah. yeah. Can you see it? Okay, it's the entropy. Uh, sorry, so entropy is uh, here. So, what I mean by entropy is, uh, well, proportionality to KB, if you wish, times the log of the number of configurations which are ground states. So this is what I mean by S ground states. So oh. you can count the number of configurations which are ground states. Uh, well, you, you, you see the increase in entropy, you can see it easily in this example. So you can see that, for example, I can frustrate this link or this link or this link. So I have three configurations apart from spin reversal that uh, are ground states of this triangular plaquette with the negative signs of the interaction. If I were working with positive signs of the interactions, I would have only one configuration, which is everybody up, yes. apart from spin reversal. So I have you know, three times more <laughs> configurations, which are ground states of the frustrated case than of the non-frustrated one. This is the increase, typical increase of ground state entropy because of uh, frustration. I see, thank you. And there's one more question. Um, can you go back to the slides, which you describe the definition for J, I, J? It's the, a hop the, the hop field, yeah. Yes, and uh, what does this NP mean? The number of patterns that you want the network to, 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 to know about, to memorize. So uh, it could be only one, and then you, know, you have a network which is not very efficient, or you can try to make NP as 
uh, as um, large as possible so as to uh, you know store a lot of patterns so uh, there is a limit actually to the number of patterns that the network of Hockel kind can 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 store and it's proportional to the number of um, of spins or of neurons that you have in the in the sample um, um, if you can only take um plus one or minus one for psi then yes. is np equals to four in this case no 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 and p can be uh, you know some number of spins so n the number of neurons times uh, some number uh, which i don't remember i think it was I think it was uh, 0 0.14, but I'm not sure. <laughs> I can check that. So it's it's some number times the number of neurons uh, that you have in the um, in the in the system. The maximal one for making the neuro the, the network functioning. Otherwise, it will not recall anything. It will just you know it, the spins will go to some paramagnetic uh, configuration in evolution, and it will not converge to these uh, pattern configurations. Oh, thank you, thank you. Uh, technically, should, uh, NP could be 2 to the power n, right? NP could be, sorry? Uh, 2 raised to n. Uh, two. 2 raised to n, because uh, each spin corresponds to, let's say, one uh, bit of... Oh, no, yes, but, but then the network doesn't work. It doesn't retreat, so it doesn't go to this uh, pattern configuration. So, only... so what, what you have to think about, of course, I mean, the image is not completely correct, but imagine that the network constructed in this way has a lot of ground states uh, which are of different kind. They are disk size. Uh, so they, 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 there are a lot of, uh, you have a free energy landscape and you have a lot of minima of this free energy landscape which correspond to the configurations of these psi eyes. Now, depending on the initial condition that you choose for your spins and depending on whether you, you know, give a hint to the network and you put it near one of these minima in the free energy landscape, your network will converge to that uh, configuration of Xi. -I. So the picture would be something like this. Okay, I don't know, something like this. This would be like the free energy landscape. And each of these minima here, which are equivalent in the sense of being at the same height in the free energy landscape corresponds to this psi i1, psi i2, and so on and so forth. Then you will have some initial condition that you can represent, uh, well, a bit naively in this picture, like uh, some, you know, a point here in this uh, free energy landscape. And then the evolution, uh, with a rule that you have to give, but you know it has been given, and I'm not discussing it uh, for the Hopfield problem, will take you say here, and then what you say is okay. I retrieved, I recognized this pattern. The network has said okay. I have shown it uh, a, an apple. Let's say that this corresponds to apples, oranges, uh, bananas. Uh, I don't know. Things like this. So then, you know, depending on, you know, uh, I don't know, I show the, uh, the network a juice and a juice, okay, it's like an orange. And then uh, instead of uh, coming here, I come here. Yeah, so I get it. It's like putting the initial condition near the basing of attraction of a certain pattern. And then you want to know if the uh, evolution takes really the configuration to that pattern, to retrieve that pattern. The problem is that if, you put too many patterns, this doesn't work anymore. You don't create a free energy landscape like this. And instead of that, you go to some disorder configuration of the spins that doesn't recognize anything, that doesn't correspond to any of the patterns. So you kill the functioning of the, of the network. Okay, okay. So uh, yeah, so basically number of uh, metastable states is the main, uh, uh, like the number of patterns, that's the connection. For exactly, this. yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Hi. Uh, how to uh, think about uh, coarsening in mean field models uh, and, and this fully connected uh, uh, lattices? Uh. Uh, okay. So uh, let me see how to how to explain it. 
so um bonjour <laughs> sorry there's people here um so you don't have a space in a mean field model right but you yeah. can identify uh, some modes like uh, effective i don't know if you are used to the word of modes but you know some uh, yeah some modes and then you can s identify which is the mode that corresponds to complete ordering so let me put it in this in this way If you work in real space for non mean field problems, a real problem in finite dimensions, then you have, you know, positions and you have distances in space. From distances in space, you can go to Fourier and you have wave vectors or modes. Yeah. Yeah. Complete order. Corresponds to k equals zero, right? Because yeah. if you have some uniform thing, this corresponds to k equals zero. So in uh, normal finite dimensional systems, uh, the coarsening processes correspond to sort of populating this k equals zero mode and depopulating yeah. the uh, k different from zero modes, which have to do with you know, modulations and things like this that you want to kill. So this has to be populated um, by the dynamics representing the course. Okay, this we understand. Now, in mean field problems, you don't have real space, you don't have Fourier transforms of real yeah. space, but you can identify in certain cases modes that play the role of this K. And you can also identify which are the modes that play the role of this K equals zero. And which is the mode that you have to populate to represent the coarsening phenomenon. And this is the mechanism whereby uh, in the, these mean field problems, uh, you can you know, make a connection between the coarsening problem and the dynamics of the mean field model and you know, uh, recover the scalings and so on and so forth. So it's... Oh. Okay. Yeah. So the eigenmodes of like something like for this Edwards and so on models like J J matrix, something of that sort, is it? Exactly. Yeah, something like that. So in, in the actual problem that we link to the coarsening system, it's like an Edwards Anderson problem on the complete graph. So okay. they have J I J S I L J. This is all to all. This is a Gaussian uh, matrix with actually plus or minus signs in it. But instead of working with easing spins, what we do is like the cat's uh, trick, which is to work with uh, spherical spins. So you have a Lagrange multiplier that imposes this spherical constraint. And the S's are real variables now. Oh. And by working with this problem, which in principle has nothing to do with coarsening, but by working with this problem and by looking at you know, the eigenmodes of this interacting uh, matrix, um, combined with the Z, you can, these are the modes. So you diagonalize this part. You... Oh, constraint leads to the interaction. Exactly. So you oh, I see, I see. diagonalize everything here. You will have lambda mu, s mu squared. This mu has nothing to do with the mu of the whole thing. Eh? It's an index here, uh, plus z uh, sum over mu, s mu squared minus n. So these are the modes. And uh, actually, you combine this one with that one because it's still just the same form, you know, the quadratic form here. So the z plus lambda mu uh, is the relevant mode that will go to zero. Hmm? That is the okay. zero of this, uh, that it's uh, the important one to control. Okay. So, okay, it was a bit uh, sketchy. Uh, if I have time in the last lecture, though, I don't think I will. <laughs> I, I, I could discuss this problem in much more detail, but okay, we'll, we'll see how far we can get. But the, okay. this is the, the, yeah, everything. Okay. Uh, just one more question. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, uh, this analogy between the uh, Edward Sanderson model and Hopefield model, uh, 
Mm-hmm. So in the uh, Edward Sanderson model, the uh, J variables are sampled from like some sort of Gaussian distribution. Yeah. But here it is like uh, sort of J square. I mean, so do they have similar critical behaviors? Uh, there, they if do. I integrate out J variables, I get like some quartic theory. Here it will be something more complicated. Yeah, they they have some similar behavior. Yes, but they they. Different thing is that here with the choice of these JIJs within the, the patterns, you force this structure of a free energy landscape with many, uh, you know, like a ferromagnetic sort of minima uh, that uh, you don't have in the other case. So in this case, you control, you know, which are these minima that you want to have in your free energy landscape that in the other case, they're sort of self-organized or self-generated. You don't have, you know, such a handle on those. So, but there, there are certain things which are similar. So, second order phase transitions, uh, uh, glassy phases that this one also has, and you want to avoid because you don't want to get your dynamic go to the glassy phase. You want to get to these pattern configurations. So, um, yeah, there are features which are similar and some other ones which are a little bit different. Okay. Uh, so, like if I'm doing some, uh, let's say, replica computation for like some mm-hmm. free energy yeah. or something. Uh, I mean, I certainly encounter a lot of complications in uh, Hopfield model compared to the Edward Sanderson, right? So this is similar. It's a, yeah, okay. it's a similar level of complications. So the ones who um, solved the uh, or did the statistical physics analysis of the Hopfield model uh, with replica techniques and also with other techniques uh, are uh, it's a very famous paper uh, by Amit. Uh, I'm going to not write it well, good friend. Uh, I don't remember the writing of this. And some Polinsky. And this is again from late 70s or 80s, perhaps 80s, 80s mostly. Uh, so the, yeah, this is the very, very famous paper that does the replica analysis of the whole thing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so maybe it's time to conclude yeah, and say goodbye <laughs> say to, to, yeah. until tomorrow. And I, I will complete the, you know, the, um, the file I'm preparing and I will send it to, to you in the afternoon. Okay. Okay. Okay, thanks a lot. Bye. See you tomorrow. See you tomorrow. Thank you very much. Thank you.